advertising data and uh, targeted targeted advertising data. Okay, so it, it, it might be the way I'm holding it. I'm not really good with these things. Uh, is that better? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the microphone that we have tonight. Uh, once they get started, I can duck out and see if we can do something about this. Uh, in the meantime, is it at least tolerable? It's worse than no microphone at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so yeah, um, I'll let the speakers uh, present. Thank you. in the microphone. It did not sound good really. Uh, so thank you guys for coming here. I'm Kira Rosberg and I lead the analytics group at Genome, the division of Yahoo. And I was told that this data visualization workshop is really more friendly than another meetup. Um, so I guess um, I'm really lucky that uh, to be here and present you. So let me just walk you quickly through the agenda. I'll give you an overview of the genome for Yahoo is our data world, and then jump into the audience wave report. It's an audience wave report is the real, the visualization of the advertising world data shows on how do you present your audience uh, to the advertiser, big data to the advertiser in a meaningful form, and also tell the advertiser where this audience can be found across the board. And then link, uh, She'll uh, jump into the case study of visual analytics. And as I'm going to go through this, you'll see, um, and I'll be discussing business, you'll see some of the data visualization uh, slides that I plotted there. So, and you guys can like see how they relate to the, uh, to the story. Maybe you can read some of them. So, Jiren from Yahoo. So, when you think about Yahoo, Yahoo is a lot of things to like. So, some people use search, other use Yahoo, go to yahoo.com, finance, oh my god news, email, groups, answers, a lot of things. So we live in advertising technology world. And what it means is we build platforms that help advertisers, um, that help advertisers uh, put solutions on how to target their audience. And when we think, if anyone here is from the advertising world or from digital advertising, they know they know the line, and the line is you have to find the right people on the right website at the right time and show them the right picture. And when you do this, you actually need a platform. You need a platform that stores all of your data, and it's able to visualize, analyze that data, and evaluate it to, to build effective audiences. So Genome is a technology platform that does data evaluation. Um, and just thinking about advertising, and digital advertising, when you, sometimes you wake up in the morning and go to yahoo.com, some of you could do, sometimes you see this huge car, automotive ad car comes out of you. This is, means someone uh, bought a yahoo.com page, homepage takeover. They paid a million dollars for this huge car to appear to everyone who is going to come to that site. So, that type of niche digital buying is not audience. It's, it's, uh, the goal of that buy is to reach the most number of people, the most people you can during one given day. What audience buying is, it, uh, is reaching a specific audience. You advertiser want to reach everyone who read the news on finance, yahoofinance.com, or you want to reach everyone who read weather reports this, this morning. Uh, whatever your audience is, you want to reach that specific group of people across the uh, platform, on whichever platform they use, PC, uh, tablet, or mobile. <laughs> and data evolution. So behind all of this audience, there is actually a, a big data collection and data selling business. And uh, whoever is not familiar, um, let's say 10 years ago, and this site put their just their advertory. I just made them up, so don't uh, don't go over that. Um, 
also was based on your data, even though they do. Uh, <laughs> so 10 years ago, if I want to uh, reach people who went to weather.com at 8 o'clock in the morning and check weather in New York, I would actually call weather.com rep and I would say, hey, can you put my tag on your website and pass me that data? It would take me days, weeks, maybe months to start getting this data. So think about, you would get data on your people sparsely, on a few people, very sparse data. Right now, you have to really be lazy not to do this data collection or data selling business. If you have a website, you will definitely be reached out by any one of the big data providers and will be asked to start passing your data. And it's additional revenue. A lot of websites actually have this as their revenue model, passing the data in addition to the display advertising. So even to the point, so this picture is not accidental. Right now the data, um, the data industry even has its standards. So there are standard eight data buckets that, uh, that, are, that have spanned across 25 different data providers. And you think about it, social data, for example, you went to facebook.com, you liked something, someone somewhere captured that away. You, um, let's say demographic data, you went to some site, you declared you're female or male, you didn't say, uh, don't share my data, that data is being collected. Uh, purchase base. Every time you use your card at ShopRite, Rite Aid, or anywhere else, this data is being collected. So think about it online, offline, and anywhere in this world. So standard 25, the, the, one, the one other thing is that's important. These data products are so at scale that they, each one of them has 100, 100 million of users or more. So it's a lot of users through a lot of data providers. And the red debate, this is a result of uh, kind of some of our salespeople favorites, they kind of ask me to put it here. Uh, so there are debates of around why is big data? Why is big data better than small data, right? And this is one of the ways to explain it. Um, and the second thing is, let's say it's a three years. Three users, we know three things about this. We know that they went to finance.com site, they read a blog about a new document card, and then they also checked the website of the data. Which are very good users to use it too, who also went to uh, finance.com and read and looked at the website. And we think, wow, out of three facts, two actually match. So these people are similar. Right? Um, and this is in the way of how, how do you like categorize, this is under umbrella, how do you categorize user? How do you find your perfect audience, right? And then I'm looking at user three, I think, well, that person only checked whether that's on. Maybe not my audience, I only, I'm also interested in finding. But when you add, a zip, when you have additional data points and all of the data providers kind of dumping you uh, new data, you, you will see that it's a lot more complex. And Think about the sequences like continuous into the infinity sometimes, right? Um, but what it, what it does is illustrate, I like this visual because it kind of illustrates the DNA. Here's the DNA of three people, and then you can see the connectors, and then you kind of see, like, starting from here on, you see your DNA pattern type of thing. So moving forward, Quickly, uh, we have 28 terabytes of data for any use here that we do not accept. 28 terabytes um, means 100 billion monthly events, 6 billion impressions, uh, 2 billion unique users. We have 250 distinct attributes on users, and we need, once we build that audience, once we know that information is user, we have 2,000 different websites to pick from. Uh, that's where we can serve as the And um, I'm trying to remember what the next slide. I think I wrote it. So uh, 
our data scientists, so the, the way we kind of keep all of this data from all the data projects is an advertise an early form of taxonomy. And our lead data scientist is a big fan of uh, method visualization. And correct, in the next slide, we'll be user to network visualize the taxonomy of this. And so, uh, so this is 0.1% of the data that we collect. So what does it mean? So we looked at it for the first time, like, well, it's really cool. And if we were to take this and show it to an advertiser, we'll say, hey, finance advertiser, go here and see the finance in market loan credit card, American Express, you're here. Uh, and then they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. If I took, I took the magnifying glass, I could so it said American Express, but I can't relate it to any other, uh, to any other data points in this graph. So it's a good data visualization. Visualization gives you an idea of how many facts are here, but it doesn't actually tell you the relationship between the facts. And just to confuse you, uh, even more, this is how the data looks like. And I know Link right now is looking at me and she wants this to say dot, dot, dot. Um, <laughs> but we don't just have like seven columns here. Uh, we actually have, like, you can think about it, we have users, date on the, uh, when the data was collected and fact ID. And this fact ID and attribute ID could be anything. That could be your weather.com. Uh, this is, that could be your offline purchase or whatever that is. So, so here is the challenge. Um, and I'm gonna take a use case and say uh, financial advertiser, financial credit card uh, provider wants to maximize the number of credit card approvals that were generated through that site. I'm not gonna say who that advertiser is. And they come to us and say, can you guys build us an audience that will maximize the number of those approvals and uh, serve that audience on the web, reach that audience, reach those people on the web with the message that they want to So this is the, uh, the reason why we created this report. Next question, John. Um, so this is a PDF. This is PD in, this is interactive PDF. I actually can like click on things, move things. Uh, this PDF came out of MicroStrategy. And uh, it's actually a flash. It's flexed program flash. So you could see many, many pieces together. So let's go back to our financial advertiser who wants to maximize approval rate. Uh, and this report has three, it's like said there are finance, demo, converted one to three which in the lingo of advertising actually in the normal language, it actually says in the last 30 days, there were 1.2 thousand people who had pos who had approval for your card. Right. And the way uh, from the visualization uh, standpoint, the way this report is structured, it has three pieces. Uh, and I just I weren't told there will be a data grid, so it has the data grid. It has three pieces. It has the uh, the title and all of the information you need to know about. It has the chart and some of the uh, interface and the presentation. This kind of like three simple So on the top, we make sure that we have a logo, we, we have audience data report, we gave it an audience page name because our bar chart or chart is so big. And the second, which is we're going to actually, whenever we go to the financial advertiser, we put the name. Say, this is the main, this is how many people look at that. This is called a flash PDF on the format because it was a flash. 
So in MicroStrategy, when you export it, it's actually going to say flash, but it's flash inside of PGL. Yeah, it, it's funny. When I say it to many people, they're like, what does exactly it mean? So it's flex programming. So what are the bars? So what are your waves here? That's one of the important things. Uh, so this colors little waves represent the mid percent. And the lift percent uh, in many industries is used differently. In this industry, is lift percent is the propensity of the users to convert or to apply for a credit card compared to the average internet user. And when you open this report, what should happen is you should see immediately which data buckets. And going back to the standard buckets, we do have eight data buckets that we need to have here. So you have your Eight data buckets, you know that your in-market is somewhat high. Maybe your search is not probably going to go directly to the page. You're not going to search for, for stuff. And you really can just click on any one of this, and everything else is going to gray out. And if you notice, as I click on this, the data table updates are uh, underneath. So the, the waves show three main numbers that we wanted to conduct, that we wanted to uh, sell advertiser. One is the minimum list. What's your minimum, uh, what's your minimum propensity to convert this, this data frames? The average list and the maximum list. And if you notice, on the, on the right and left side, you also have um, the top, the maximum of the lift percentage will correspond to the maximum at the highest bucket. So the report is created such that this bar always works together with that chart. So the visual is always optimized to show the most color. Right? The other piece about this chart is um, the other piece about this chart is actually the scale. The scale is logarithmic. You can't, uh, it will actually linear, this would go out and like to a to brand presentation, I don't know. Um, and the, uh, so in the third piece about this chart and actual interactivity, it solves the problem of group by more than one dimension. User will always want two attributes. They want to know what data bucket this falls under and where the data comes from. And this is this accomplishment. And the reason we do that is sometimes advertiser would trust one data source more than another data source. For example, I don't know, um, Nielsen is a trusted data source, right? Or some people trust Bluepie or Yahoo, um, something like that. So again, as you probably saw me always going to back to this bucket, and I thought as this button, when I click on it, it's it resets the whole report. So I can go on and, and play with it. For example, B3, you can tell immediately it's only providing data to the like that. Social? Sure. read an article and you, that's your, um, that's the data provider. And then we have a lot of me and they're organizing some, um, they're, they're aggregating some social media data as well. And feel free to, uh, to ask questions if you Yeah. Just to clarify, what does each of these major categories mean? B2B, demographic, and margin, interest, lifestyle, purchase based, search, social? Is that the type of destination site? Well, this is type of data when it gets aggregated. <coughs> um, the reason they are this ten the reason they're this eight categories is sometimes, like for example, if you're a Pepsi advertiser, what data are you gonna use? as an indicator that someone buys a Pepsi, right? One of the ways you could do it 
you can use purchase that you can you can track your um, you can track your in store purchases on the, the card or something else like the uh, supermarket purchases right. and actually see how that's done. Like different data works for different kinds of advertiser. And this is like the standard industry standard to categorize them that way. So are you classifying the attributes, the facts? All the users, yeah. Classifying the attributes. Okay. Yep. So for each of these components, it seems like it just always starts from zero on the left or not? The minimum? Yeah, let me right. So it looks like we have sort of three values per thing, right? And the middle one is the average, and the right is the max. So this for example is negative. 66% like this. Okay, so these are different calculations of lift that you get from different providers? Yep. It seems like you know, an example of that blue one that goes very high, you're giving a lot of ink to the maximum, right? Yeah. Is there a way to show the distribution of values? Or why did you choose this way of showing it? As opposed to? Like, show what different values you actually get from each provider as yes. identity. Yeah, so that's exactly <coughs> the question we anticipate that advertiser will ask. And what they'll ask me, okay, I see this graph and here's my 536% lift, but what is it, right? What is it and what are other things that kind of go down here down the slope? And, and this is the reason we had to have the data, the, the table here. We wanted to be, we first we wanted to be transparent. We wanted to tell that it exactly here is exactly the data specific attributes that make that data successful. And also, um, advertisers want, don't want black boxes. They want to know, they want to understand what they exactly what those things are. Yep. Your facts, your segments that are part of the different data providers. Let's say you have across all the providers twenty thousand unique segments, behavior segments, such as example, automotive convertible. Let's say there's three other providers that have the same segment. Mm -hmm. uh, do you condense those similar segments into the same bucket? Or do you just simulate do you how long is that the how many different facts are you summarizing that you're ranking? Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of touching several questions and you're in front of head, uh, which is cool. So you're touching overlap a little bit between data providers, right? And then also you're touching, uh, can you take all of your 300,000 facts that you, that you have in your platform and actually display them here? So the answer is, I would say I'm not really interested in all 300,000 facts. They're interested in the relevant facts. So, and this data table actually has a filter. It only takes facts that cover at least 1% of the users that of those who applied and were approved for a card. And if I look at my data table, and I have this, if I do inverse of rag, it's me. So you have 2,600. I have 2,736 facts in this report. But but it could you is it possible in this analysis? Are you is that already condensed to the most unique segment? In other words, because there's some nomenclature like Nielsen Connections BlackBerry. What if you had another provider that had Nielsen something very similar to that, right? It's a different yeah. naming convention. Would that yeah. be excluded, or is that is that included in that category? It's going to be separate. So let's say you have Nielsen Connections Library, and then MasterCard would also have a, have a segment connection library. We're going to treat them as two separate data points for the purposes of this report. Okay. We later are going to combine those. The question, the real question is, what's the overlap between those two segments? Are they really the same? What are the really users that are part of that thing? Thanks. Yeah. Oh, one more question. 
Yeah. So this data actually allows a consumer or a product or an advertiser to meet a decision and have a conclusion, right? Yeah. So could you give me a sample conclusion that say Pepsi could reach it after seeing it and say, okay, I want to do this. So what would be a sample conclusion and how would Pepsi reach it like that by looking at the sequence? Yeah, yeah. So if you don't mind, I'm going to continue the story of the credit card approvals. So in the credit card approvals case, we, at the end of the day, we're actually going to have advertisers go through the facts and look at them and actually say if they feel that those, these data points, something they want to pursue. Like for example, let's say, let's look at fact number one, in market uh, finance products and services so if you're, uh, if you're refinancing, if you're refinancing something, you are going to be also interested in applying for a credit card. You want, you'd like those extra dollars. Or let's say you're getting a new mortgage. You want the extra safety net um, and get a credit card. Or you're, for some reason, upscale earner, whatever the data means, uh, and you also would like that. Then, um, if you actually, this report shows one funny thing. So if you look at uh, rank A, how far must sleep? We're going back and forth in the team trying to figure out what that was. It's, it's like if you're reading about sleep on some medical websites, because like sleepless nights, maybe it's a time to apply for a card. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we usually call this discovery fact. In discovery fact, like credit card company will absolutely know like the stuff three or top four, right? They'll absolutely know that people who are getting new houses will also want to get credit card. People who are refinancing as an extra protection, they would want to get credit card. But there are some like we call them discoveries, um, things like this. Maybe, uh, maybe the credit card advertiser will have their own idea of why these people might be part of reading this about like sleep on medical sites. And then, so we will come up with the data strategy. This is how we say, okay, hey advertiser, we're gonna take top end facts for you, depending on your budget, and we'll target those people. And the <coughs> next thing is where we're gonna target those people. And the last part of this report is this follow up. So these are the sites where those in-market products and services people can be found. These are top 20 sites. And there are a couple of statistics around this and whatnot, uh, but that's pretty much it. The, uh, the ranking, uh, the index, how is that kind of, I guess I'm going to go into later the overlap size. That's simply the number of segments. Uh, yeah, numbers. totally, I can, I can do this. If you guys are interested, I can go through the stats um, and tell you what they mean. So the, the main ranking is by Lyft. <coughs> so the same order that Lyft is, that's the order of ranking. The highest Lyft gets ranked number one. Then you have overlap, which is just how many people, so the users available is the size of each data attribute. So there are, uh, 119,000 people applied for, for uh, refinancing, right? And then you'll see, okay, out of this 119,000, 11 of them applied for, uh, for a credit card. So that's how you do it. So 11 of them applied and got approved, that's your overlap number of 1%. So do you take in the uh, data from the credit card company about No. This is on pure Probably. 30 days. Last 30 days converters. So they have one super valuable customer as opposed to 100 not so valuable. We can if advertiser asks that. Let's say that they, they don't care about this 1.2 thousand users, they care about this other 300. Can you build a report of those and see how they're different from others? Yeah, how do these uh, statistics check out? How, how reliable are these statistics over time? If, if you were to do this for for the same month last year, what would those percentage be? <coughs> yeah, we've done it. Sometimes we go back. Uh, this report is actually pretty, pretty, uh, pretty popular. And I was just telling someone, it's usually salespeople who present this report, not sales engineers. 
And advertisers, like sometime like three months, half a year later, they would ask, oh, can we see it again? Can we see if, it's, if there is a shift? So this is what happens with like, interactions between genome Yahoo and advertiser. In real life, uh, so this report is being run on the back end all the time, right? And you optimize towards your best users all the time. Because this is just a visualization for them. And have you ever, uh, is it hidden perfectly? Do you ever uh, include something like an interesting see a CPA metric that would an average CPA for each of those different segments? Because if you did the ranking, yeah. what's the most expensive way yeah. segment? If you find something probably a little different picture. This is a good point. This does not include the data cost. So if, if data cost, if the advertiser wants to use this data, they will need to pay extra for each of this and there will be data cost if this report doesn't. But I think the real, like for, for other people who like, like uh, predictions and data and stats, there's this full metric and it's called the reach rank. And we actually they kind of, because we felt that lift itself doesn't take into account everything. It shows you the highest propensity to convert, but it actually does not, that does not do a good job if advertising wants to spend a million dollars. Because how much money you can spend on targeting 120,000 users, only 5, 10,000, 15,000, right? So you need to balance, you need to balance the scale, you need to find that your audience to be big enough. You need to balance the scale and performance. And usually, um, for strategy creation, we recommend to start big. It's better to start big and then optimize than start very small and um, and then kind of try building on top. And if I do, if I do so, you guys can see this. So this Yahoo fact, finance, loan, mortgage, I'm pretty sure these are like articles on across Yahoo and there's two million views, sorry, three million users on Yahoo that read about finance. And it's number one back by the trend. So we'll most likely recommend to them that they start here if they want to reach the scale of the So again, this is um, 60 with the, all, almost 3,000 facts and 20 websites for each. It's about 60,000 data points you're looking at right here in this report. Can you rank? Reach rank in descending order, in no, ascending order. See how it looks like. Ascending or descending? Let's ascend. Actually, they all come up to this side presentation part because they're big enough. I don't know if I would recommend this one because it's 2000. <laughs> um, there's a couple of. Uh, there's a couple of stories that our um, that I was asked to tell you guys, um, <laughs> and they're they're specific to several reports that were run for real advertisers. And one of the real advertisers, if you heard about this, guys, they're CTEs. You know who CTEs are? Who? They're CTEs. Okay. They're like combination between Yelp and uh, Open Table. You can read your views and then you can uh, reserve your table right there online. So their story is they have locations in DC, New York, and Florida. That's where they specialize in. And their data strategy, they don't have data strategy. Their strategy is geo-target. Target people who live in New York, DC, and Philly. Um, and we actually ran this report for them. And that data, and this geo-targeting didn't work, by the way. It didn't perform as, as well as they, would, they were hoping they would, would perform. And they've asked us to run this way report, or we volunteered, I don't know the story. And a couple of facts that came up on top were destination New York, Philly, DC, not residence, which kind of tells you 
you want to target people who travel to this uh, city versus uh, travel uh, people who live there. Maybe they did a good job on uh, travel sites or advertising the travel sites or advertising outside of the major cities. Maybe their penetration rates are low, but and they've actually created the data strategy that was targeted towards people traveling to this cities. Uh, and then another example, as we have a, a wedding registry plan. And wedding registry, they they trying to identify any indication of someone is planning a wedding, as you can imagine. And the biggest and the wildest guess you can make, it's going to be a woman from 18 to 40, right? <laughs> All right. And when we ran this report for them, and sometimes the, uh, all the normal things, reading wedding magazines, articles, or whatnot about wedding planning. And when we ran this report, we found a couple of interesting facts, which are tra travel planning 180 days plus. <laughs> so if you have someone who's planning their travel half a year in advance or more, that's probably a honeymoon. And also, and it also helped to create a strategy that would like target those people. So these are the stories um, that our sales asked me to share with you. I hope I can Okay, I think this is it for me. Um, I'm gonna uh, introduce Lin Kwan. She's gonna show you the real, the scientific uh, stuff.
and um, and then maybe after tracking the data, <coughs> I would like to identify what kind of analysis I can do. If time series analysis is going to tell me to do something, or maybe I need machine learning algorithm to build audiences, right? And then after I got my audiences, at just not the end of my job, I need to monitor. I want to know my algorithm is what is working or not working. I want to know why it's working and it's not working. So let's start from the overview. This one I uh, created a time series plot. I because of taxonomy has enabled us to define explicitly for the uh, cluster of users naturally. And each event in our system got a time step. So I group by time. The x axis, just the date information. The y axis, I got the number of impressions delivered for one campaign. OSM, you remember the category tree, the fancy 0.01 taxonomy tree, the open segment segment. <laughs> what? Nature. 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 Okay. Open, open segment manager. <laughs> Open Segment Manager. Thank you, Jihan. <laughs> right. Um, so what kind of analysis I can do for this? Oh, sorry. I can develop a time series analysis, right, for those aggregated impressions. I can identify the ACF, PACF, and periodogram. If you don't understand what I'm telling, for the statistics, <coughs> no worry. What I try to get is this one, the forecast. The best model for the uh, least sample data, I figure out is ARIMA 101. And then I able to get the trend, able to get the prediction, and got the 15% uh, and 95% confidence interval. So easily we can check the trend, seasonality, autocorrelation, irregularity, all those statistics use, use time series analysis. And what is uh, analysis going to use? We can forecast the inventory. We can identify the anomaly impression and so on and so forth. And after I got the impression information, I would like to see how my campaign performs. So let's check 100 campaign performances. The X axis here is my 100 campaigns impression. The Y axis is the conversion rate. Actually, it turns out the positive conversion rate people convert after they see the X. And I'm able to fit a blue line based on Louis smoother and able to create 95% confidence bump. And the dots actually are scattered around. And if the campaigns in this area, actually they have higher conversion rate compared to the average. They are outperforming campaigns. On the other hand, you see those small campaigns, they are not um, using the confidence bump, they are underperforming. Maybe the reason just they don't, we don't deliver enough information, uh, impression for those campaigns. And then maybe you use this kind of techniques can tell the account manager or backend engineer to walk, watch out, um, do something, make the first campaigns perform. This one is a outlier identification, identify masters. After we got the big picture, the campaign and their performances. Maybe we want to know multiple campaign performances by category information. Say I have different kinds of campaigns, auto, finance, uh, insurance, and also I got some different kinds of websites. I got a blog, auto, and those are different publishers by category and I create a heat map using the red color to indicate the high conversion rate, blue color indicates uh, low conversion rate. 
based on the HEMA, we can do the comparison by the advertiser category, say for this column, um, is consumer electronics actually have more successful uh, and higher conversion rate, which means runs better. And to the other, like, um, it's called insurance. In my sample, those campaigns don't work quite well. And also, I cycle though this, this category, say people um, run auto campaign, they're almost always checking from the website. That's um, use this P map. We can indicate specific user intentions and also um, show the user interest. Okay. What kind of analysis if we using this sample data? I think about something um, relating to association rule. If you're familiar cross marketing, there is a famous example. Um, people purchase diaper, also purchase beer. Yeah. <laughs> so borrow the same idea. Let's do the association rule for our website. See people visiting certain website category, what kind of another stuff they are going to uh, visit. So I use R to create, um, do the analysis to identify uh, in the sample, 241 rules. Um, and it, it's actually an interactive um, tool allow you to select the top performances rule. And after your selection, all those rules are going to show up in the left-hand side. And the top rule actually for visiting business, technology, travel, we are going to visit uh, entertainment. That's the rule we are able to identify use the data set. And so do you use regression analysis to do the prediction? This, this one is not a uh, regression. Machine learning? It's, it's not machine learning, it's an association rule. You actually oh. calculate the support number confidence and this number are like um, empirical numbers. Um, it's a little hard to see. What are you using to do the interactive in R? Uh, it's a package called R rule vision. R rule vision, yes. And after you identify those uh, rules, can we uh, zoom in a little bit to see just one campaign. Forget about multiple campaign, just one campaign. Um, to see different distribution for our uh, uh, website category. You can see the um, box part here. You have different conversion rates, and then you have different variances around conversion rates. And you see they have like high details here indicate um, some websites have high performances, and and um, do data mining using this kind of data set is actually hard. And you're wondering why they have some that kind of um, high variances. What those heavy users means? So <laughs> let me bring in my favorite. <laughs> the heterogeneous <laughs> network. Say, on the left hand side, I got three users. The first user got like six values. And the second user got like about 20, 30 facts. And the last user, the third user, they got 100 facts. That's the reason we got heterogeneity of our user interact with facts. And mm -hmm. if we put those these users with these same facts and connecting them together, you get the right hand side. That's the complicated data we have. It's like you have different 
the red up means users, they share different facts and kind of the big huge. Use those information, how you going to uh, develop a successful machine learning algorithm to pick up the audiences, top performances audiences. In Gina, we use uh, three major modeling mo models. First, we use um, nearest neighbor in collaborative filtering. And then we have logistic regression with those regularization. And then we uh, have call vector machines. Uh, depends on different categories, uh, de depends on different um, kind of as different kinds of goals for the campaigns, we run different algorithms to um, target the top performances of user. After I got the model, uh, you mean nearest neighbor? Or uh, define some metrics like the um, Pearson coefficient and those um, like, I forgot, like cosine similarity. So those are different metrics and then you combine them. <laughs> After I got the audiences, I would like to know if my algorithm runs or not. Run, running or not running good. So I use AC, uh, a, I use C to as a metric to measure uh, uh, the model. If you don't understand AUC, it doesn't matter. It's a statistic. The higher the number, the better. <laughs> so I got some campaigns, 25 campaigns. Some perform and just OK, around 0.6. I got very good campaigns performed near point A and point nine. And I'm wondering why this campaign got some numbers high and some got very low. Um, one information I'm checking is number of converters. Say if I got lots of converters information, my models got lots of information to identify those positive cases, it runs better. So the web bucket actually are large converters in uh, campaigns. On the other hand, if a small campaign, low converter volume, not that much useful information for my model actually perform not that well. And I also suggest us maybe we need a richer model to identify those um, um, algorithms not quite running right. And last but not least, I'm going to summarize all my analysis using Hadoop. If uh, nowadays people say Hadoop, uh, say big data, not mention Hadoop is kind of not that serious. <coughs> so at Yahoo, we have Hadoop. We also have H base, Pick, and High as a bottom support for us. And we run analysis, including predicting analytics like time series. We do anomaly detection, just as I show you those uh, confidence bounds. And we do statistical analysis like association rules. And we have different machine learning algorithms running. And also because it's Hadoop um, uh, setup, we also have some map function, reduce function able to run. Uh, run on top of it. And yeah, analytic tools, we use R, we use Maven Mahal, and also we have Python and Java on top of them to run the analytics. What we try to do is support pro products, support analytics, and also support science and research. That's pretty much I have today. So thank you. So this is really cool from like a data science perspective, but isn't it kind of creepy? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, you guys know people in a relationship, you don't get pregnant, 
you know, if they're planning a honeymoon, you know, if they have problems sleeping, what kind of like medications they're buying. <laughs> well, let's just go. I mean, these, these, these regimes in Eastern Europe it's just to be like a dream. All this information. Like, it's just weird. It just, I don't know. It just, I get weird because I don't want to There's two things. So, there's two things. One is some of the data's perspective. Your medical records and all this stuff. Sure. The other thing, the second thing is, you've seen how our data looks like. It has the user ID, but it doesn't actually says, here are Roidberg at yahoo.com. So we don't know who you are. We know the virtual browser person, but we don't know. The personal identifiable information is a very much protected by privacy. They're actually, it is, it is. Yahoo's world of Yahoo registered users lives absolutely in a separate place from the from the advertising target. So it's, it's we need to keep that balance because there is actually a team in Yahoo that they call themselves paranoids. Uh, I think it's their official title. If you go to Yahoo weekend and see Yahoo paranoid, right? Okay, I don't want to deal with this person. So any little change or any new data provider that we get the data from goes through the paranoids. And until they approve it, we cannot get the data for targeting. That's true. I think this, this thing is regulated to the, to the extent of your browser and stuff. Yes? <laughs> but, then, but then think about it. If it's, if it's in the context of targeting ads, and what would you rather see? something that's not relevant to you at all, like a computer game, let's say if you don't play, versus... I never look at that. <laughs> that's fine too. Um, that's fine too. Does Google have something similar? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Yeah. You no, no, no. That was a sarcastic remark, yeah, particularly yeah. from a privacy point of view. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, the, the data, was it pretty much... Uh, of course, it was mass, but it was pretty real data, correct? This was not that you were showing real data. That, 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 right? Is there any reason why you hid some of the cost information that showed kind of overlay cost per CPA or something like that with conversion <coughs> um, in your analysis? Because it would have been interesting. Ultimately, an advertiser wants to see the most efficient way to uh, get in front of an, uh, a user <coughs> and have them perform some action. And just wondering if uh, you ever thought about <coughs> providing a visual that showed and ultimately ranked the most expensive way that would provide the most effective way of reaching your <coughs> user. Yeah, I think from the ad from how much it is supposed to advertiser perspective, it goes pretty much smooth out. So we negotiated rates with the data provider so that we can offer this we can offer a standard price for data. 